Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for being here and part of the Humanoids Legacy Panel. My name is Harley Sobaka, and I am the sales rep for Humanoids. I'm very excited to be moderating a panel full of creators that I admire so much. I am a fan of each and every one of you guys. So let's go ahead and introduce the panelists. First, we have Fabrice Geiger. Fabrice Geiger is a Swiss entrepreneur and Emmy award-winning television producer. In 1988, Fabrice purchased humanoids from European media giant Hatchet. Besides fostering talent, his goal was to implement a unique and creative approach that emphasizes international collaboration and multimedia opportunities. Mark Wade is a New York Times bestselling author whose work has appeared in countless languages across the globe. Over the course of his almost four decades in the comic book industry, Mark has developed characters and stories for DC and Marvel and almost every other franchise currently enjoying success across all media platforms. Kingdom Come, which he created for DC Comics has become one of the highest selling graphic novels in history. He has received every major award in the industry. Mark Russell is the author of not one, but two books about the Bible, God is Disappointed in You and Apocrypha Now. In addition, he is the writer behind various DC comic books such as Prez, The Flintstones, and Exit Stage Left, The Snacklepuss Chronicles. He lives in obscurity with his family in Portland, Oregon. He is in obscurity. Brian just talked to him for five minutes about the neighborhood. <laughs> We're going to pretend that didn't happen before okay. camera happened, Mark. Right, okay. <laughs> Tula Latoy is a pen name of illustrator and author of, oh gosh, Mark, now you messed me up. I was in my group. <laughs> <laughs> Tula Latoy is the pen name of illustrator Lisa Wood, born and raised in Yorkshire, England. Tula specializes in comics, film, and editorial illustration as well as being the founder and director of the world-renowned Thought Bubble Festival. Tula has been awarded with both Bob Clampett Humanitarian Awards by the San Diego Comic-Con Eisner Committee for her charitable and fundraising work and a GLAAD Media Award for Outstanding Comic Book uh, for the Wicked and Divine issue number 13. Last but not least, and I had to really, really cut this bio down a lot, Brian Michael Bendis. <laughs> Bendis is an award-winning comics creator, Amazon and New York Times bestseller, and one of the most successful writers working in mainstream comics. For the last 20 years, Brian's books have consistently sat on top of the nationwide comic and graphic novel sales charts. He has consulted on Marvel movies and shows, created new characters like Miles Morales and Riri Williams, and won multiple awards, including a Peabody Award. He also lives in Portland with his wife, Elisa, his gorgeous daughters, Olivia, Tabitha, Sabrina, and his dashing son, London, and his dogs, Lucky and Max. All right, now that we have met and introduced our phenomenal panel, let's go ahead and dive in. So Humanoids was established in France in the early 1970s, and it's known for dynamic art and storytelling. Fabrice, what makes Humanoids different as a publisher, and how do you see our legacy so far? Well, I think that its origins make Humanoids different as a publisher. And, and by that, I'm not meaning the place, Paris, France, but rather by whom and why this publishing uh, house has been created. Uh, when artists Moebius and Philippe Druyet, along with writer Jean-Pierre Dionnet, founded Les Humanoids Associés, Humanoids, in 1974, they created a company at their image. And in order to be able to experiment, develop subjects that couldn't develop at the more conservative uh, structures they used to work for, they first published a magazine called Metal Hurlant. And it was so inventive, so free. I mean, it was a revolution. And these guys were not interested only uh, in uh, the European bande dessinée. I mean, they loved American comic books. Humanoids was the first uh, publisher in Europe to publish creators such as Will Eisner, Richard Corbin, or even novelists such as Arlen Ellison, Bukowski, and many others. And uh, they were also among the first to publish Japanese manga in Europe with titles such as uh, uh, Barefoot Gen. The magazine, the magazine got translated into numerous languages around the world, including heavy metal in the US. And their story went on for uh, close to 12 years. Yeah, 12 years uh, with highs and lows and many adventures, including one comic book magazine made only by female creators in the 70s. 
and so on. So uh, basically, that's the legacy uh, I started with when I took the company over in 1988. Uh, freedom, culturally open-minded and curious, progressive or even transgressive, international. And I did make it truly international in the sense that Humanities has become the only graphic novel publishing company to have a direct presence in the US, in Europe, and in Japan. So we have pushed the envelope, uh, continually uh, raised the bar in terms of quality by, by, by giving the, the creators the space they needed to, to, to excel. And I think that the Metabarance is a very good example of that created in the in 90s, early 90s. And I believe that my Swiss origins pushed me to consider a book as not only uh, for its content, but also uh, as an object, uh, which was another revolution uh, that we started with you know, quality printing, hardcover, sewn binding. And I think that in terms of legacy, uh, all this still matter in the way we develop books and uh, publish books in 2020. Definitely. When I ran a comic book shop, people who loved humanoid stuff, they loved it because of the, the amazing quality, not just of the content, but also the actual books. So now my next question, Fabrice, you don't, you don't get to answer this question because it's not fair, but we're going to go around and I'm going to ask each one of you what your favorite humanoids book is and why. So let's start with Mark Wade. There's, I mean, there's many to choose from, and I'm not supposed to pick favorites at this point, although the Ink Owl obviously set trends and, and was groundbreaking in so many ways. On a personal level, it's Louisa Now and Then, which is sort of the book we published a couple of years ago right now. Yeah, uh, yeah magical, magical realism book about a uh, young woman troubled, opens up her front door and there's her 15 year old self just standing there. And the two of them have to figure out what's going on and why and how they learn from each other. I, I love that book. Love it, great coming of age book. Okay, Mark Russell. Uh, for me, I also really love the Inkle. Inkle just blew my mind when I read it. But my, I think my favorite actually is uh, the Meta Barons, because to me it just reads like uh, the forgotten mythology of a future civilization. It's, it's crazy. It's it's they're very reminiscent of, of of Greek mythology, and I think that does the thing that all great mythology does, where it um, explains the world through stories that are entirely gripping both as stories and as, as metaphor. And I, yeah, I can't say enough good about, about the Metabarons. It's a classic. Tulo, what's your favorite book? Um, mine, um, mine is one that people probably wouldn't expect me to say, um, cause my, my big love is sci-fi and I originally came to humanoids living sci-fi stuff and watching Blade Runner and everything, um, years ago and as a child, but my, my favorite set of books are actually Bouncer, the Westerns by Jodorowsky and Book, and, um, I, I just can't get enough of them. I can't quite place my finger on why I love them so much, but I think the world building is incredible. The illustration's beautiful. And the way Jodorowsky tells the story, it's um, it's so dark and gritty, built on characters, so many strange things happening in that environment. And I've, I just love it. I never get tired of it. It's, it is one of it our overall classics. I like that. Okay, Brian. Yeah, I was, uh, I was bringing oh. that. Yeah, <laughs> really. So I actually have just off camera a shelf of the giant size humanoids that I bought with my money. So not freebies. But oh, that I was you. Are. That was you. Yeah. Okay. You're welcome. <laughs> and uh, I know that feeling. Yeah. And uh, um, uh, I, I, I love the Incal so much. And um, I, uh, and I'm I am in awe of its influence in our modern culture, and it continues to spread. Uh, and it's interesting as our culture is constantly in flux, and in ways most of us who study it almost like pop culture professors and have since we were kids, uh, it has blossomed in areas we did not think would ever happen. And I think the uh, influence of the Incal is stunning to watch because uh, it did feel. Uh, when I was younger, 
it felt like some jewel that you and like 14 other people in America knew about. And, um, uh, you know, my introduction to Mobius is through the Marvel graphic novels at the time. That's, that, that's basically my age group. Like that's how you would, how you would buy that stuff. And as I got older and uh, humanoids became a thing and they started to package this stuff uh, uh, the way it may have been intended and in ways it was not intended, but makes you appreciate it even more. Hence the giant size uh, versions, they take up a great deal uh, of what is my tomb. I, I feel every time I buy one, it's another brick in the tomb here. And I'm just gonna seal myself in one day. But um, but getting to experience that as, as we age is pretty great. Yeah, and the In Call is actually the highest selling science fiction graphic novel of all time. How many, how many millions have we sold at this point, Fabrice? Over three. Yeah, I think it's over, I feel like it's over four now. I feel no, like- No, I think it's over 3.5. But uh, yeah, being close to four, yeah. That um, genuinely makes me happy. I did not know that. That's fantastic news. That's really great. Um, also, we're already talking about it, but Brian, my next question is for you. And it's you wrote the intro to our most recent printing of the end call. Yes. So your origins for writing have mostly been in more crime and noir. So what drew you to something that was so surreal and psychedelic? Uh, well, Fabrice asked me, he goes, uh, hey, you want to write the intro? I'm like, yeah, yes, I would like to do that. But it's, it's, um, uh, you, you kind of like forget, like, I didn't like think my name was going to be on it. So now people will bring it to me to sign. Oh, <laughs> no, it's, it's, I do it all the time. I love it. No, because I actually have enjoyed every conversation signing that book has brought to my life. Like, um, and again, I'm not comparing myself to any creator, but when I was a young, uh, Frank Miller introduced me to Will Eisner. Like that, like that's how I, that's how, you know, we all have a path to how we discover the history of stuff. And there are certain creators that kind of gone out of their way to take whatever spotlight they have and go, oh no, you should look at this, right? Um, and um, I remember that feeling. And I get that feeling a lot as an educator. Like if we get that, that's kind of like the juice of being a teacher is that when you can introduce something to something they would never have seen before or just, or open a door and you could see that look on their face. Like I had no idea Thomas could do this. I had no idea. Uh, it, it's kind of great. And so for people who who's in on, on comics, particularly in America as superheroes, it's kind of fun to like, just kind of like, gently uh, you know slide your interest in, in into the spotlight so yeah so i you know i've been very selective on what i write intros for but you uh, of course couldn't help but do that but i remember the real reason i was excited to do it was because i've spent most of my life yelling at anyone who would listen about how people are ripping off the ink and isn't good. And you, like, and like some people rip off stuff gloriously and everybody knows it. Like, you know, we all rip off like Blade Runner and we say, well, I stole that from Blade Runner, but ink seems to be stolen from the most. And there doesn't seem to be a crime scene. Like no one ever commits, you know, no one ever uh, admits it. And as we were getting older from the fifth element on up, as soon as like CGI became like a thing, uh, the backgrounds of every sci-fi movie that gave a damn started looking like the end call uh, up until like, like last year's uh, um, uh, Ghost in the Shell. I mean, they're not good movies, but the backgrounds and the production design are sometimes beyond spectacular where you're looking at the background going, can I go to that movie? Can we move the camera over to what's going on over there? I would like to watch that. Yeah. And that is always the end call somewhere in the background. So I was just dying to tell everyone, stop ripping it off. Stop. <laughs> That's not the lesson of comics. When I get the impulse, we've all had the impulse of, I want to touch this thing and be part yeah. of it and share it. But uh, it, as, as we've all gotten older, you realize the lesson of the in call is to kind of look beyond the genre to see what else is there on your own terms. And, and so that's what I want, wrote in the intro. And that's kind of, as we go as educators, kind of like what we want to talk about the most when we talk about it. Look at it, love it, learn it, and then do your own in-call. Yeah. Your own version, yeah. <laughs> I love that. We're going to save that clip and we're going to just put it on our Instagram constantly. Um, Tula, 
you are a huge science fiction fan. And I also heard a rumor that you really are a big fan of Barbarella, which is actually a humanoid title that inspired the classic movie. So can you tell us how you kind of identify with that title and what drew you to that one specifically? Yeah, um, actually, I have a confession to make that I've, I've not read it, but I, <laughs> I have the issues in French. And um, that was always a big thing for me when I was younger, um, having these beautiful comics that you can't understand and you spend a long time trying to figure out what exactly is in them. And since you guys have printed the hardcover, that's like something I've got to get because now I can finally read it. Um, but I think um, with Barbarella, um, it's, it's kind of, you know, very, very similar to a lot of the stuff I grew up reading, which I don't, I don't talk about very much because it's like sexy comics, heavy metal and stuff. But I mean, the Europeans do that better than anyone. And I think that's what kind of um, set a lot of those titles apart from other stuff at the time that, you know, when you're dealing with um, erotic comics in a sci-fi setting or a horror setting, um, nobody does it as good as some of the artists and writers that were in heavy metal and you know the Barbarella stuff the illustrations are just so utterly unique I'd stare at them for so long just this beautiful kind of bold 60s psychedelic aesthetic but really kind of you know almost a precursor to what was going on in you know, some American indie comics, um, that, that kind of really jagged style. Um, I, I love all of that. And obviously it inspired this amazing movie, um, <laughs> which is just incredible. I love it. Yeah, it's so funny you say that too, because I'm a huge fan of yours and your art and your art sometimes looks very 60s to me. So I yeah, love thank you. <laughs> Now, a lot of you, actually, I think all of you have worked in the comic book world for what we call the big two, so DC and Marvel comics. So what makes the characters and stories in Humanoids titles different from the ones in DC and Marvel? Um, let's start with Brian. Oh, with me. Um, well, I, I think with, with um, I mean, the first thing that popped into my head uh, with that question was uh, just, first of all, these, these what you what you publish are more for adults and more for a, a, a sophisticated palette, as it were. Um, particularly in America, I I, I I I I'm aware of different tastes in different uh, regions, but I, I definitely feel that um, uh, that that the, the mainstream Marvel and DC characters are kind of morally set in a way that everyone's labels pretty tight, the heroes of the heroes, the villains of the villains, and their morality tales where with the more, more mature, sophisticated sci-fi, it may take you about 80 pages to figure out who the hero is, right? Like who the actual antagonist and protagonist is. And I, obviously we, we, all, we all love that, but that's the first thing that popped in my head is, is with the more sophisticated palette comes a more sophisticated, um, uh, narrative and 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 what have you, and that part is, is some of the parts we steal and, and bring into our into our world. And, and in fact, the one thing I was thinking of that connected is uh, and and Tula is is part of this. We we work on Legion of Superheroes as as did Mark Wade, and uh, so you're projecting a, a very high, far out sci-fi that could go anywhere. And you know, uh, and so applying the lessons of the in-call to the DC universe is very interesting to us. And even in the way I described it to all the uh, collaborators is that like uh, no, no Kirby, no Mobius, no John Berkey, because those are the three influences you see on almost all sci-fi. What else is there? What else is beyond? So, and that is trying to get to our own in -call, like I was talking about before. Mark Russell. You know, I think what draws me to uh, humanoids is it just has a deeper dimension of storytelling. Like what the, the, the comics and the stories I love in general uh, really work on several dimensions. I mean, it's got to have that sort of kinetic, energetic dimension where something's actually happening. And that's where I think the big two sort of excel. Uh, but it, then on top of that, it's also got to have like an emotional resonance. It's got to be like, how am I connected to these characters? I'm going to miss them when they're gone. Am I thinking about them when they're not on the page? 
that's something the big two does mildly successfully. Uh, and But then third, and in some ways, most importantly, it's got to have this deeper sort of intellectual or spiritual connection where it's saying something about the world bigger than just, you know, telling a, a story. And I think that's the thing that's present in all the humanoids comics that I, that I read that you rarely see in, in other um, in uh, other publications and other comic books uh, in the industry. So that's, to me, that's, it, that's really storytelling at its, at its most, um, at its most meaningful. And uh, that, I think that's something that I, I really count on when I read a humanoids comic. I love that. Tula. Um, yeah, but, I mean, I remember the first time I came across some humanoid spec, I think it was Son of a Gun, um, in the comic store I used to work in. And the thing that immediately pulled me to it was the art, because I'm an artist. That, that's kind of the thing that always draws me into the story first. Um, and then narrative takes over if you're enjoying it. Um, but with humanoids, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. Like um, growing up, you know, in in my teens, like in the in the earlier days of you know when Vertigo was just starting, you'd have you'd have your regular monthly comics. And these like very, very intricate covers that would pull you in and then you'd open up the comic book and the inside was always very different. And, you know, sometimes it was amazing and sometimes it was not so amazing. And for the first time with humanoids, what's on the cover is on the inside and you're just staring at this glorious artwork. Um, so for me, that always pulled me in. But then with humanoids, it's like, as I was saying before, the world building is just it's it's on a whole other level. It's just these incredible stories, um, you know, with Inkel, as we were saying, and Meta Barons, you know, I've I've never really experienced science fiction like that. And it, and it was film that brought me there as well, kind of around the same time, like finding out afterwards that like my favorite films, Blade Runner and, uh, and Alien were inspired by this whole universe. And then it all kind of made sense. Yeah, very true. Mark Wade? I, much what Tula said is the visual aesthetics of, of the actual package. I mean, it, the stories, yes. And I can't say anything more to that than, than Mark and Brian haven't already said better. But it's, to me, it's the visual aesthetics. I mean, when I was growing up, you know, I just bought newsstand comics like everybody else. So the first time I come across humanoid stuff, it's, uh, you know, holy, so this is not Kurt Swan. This is not... John Romita, what is this? And there's just, it, for me, it was such a leap forward in terms of what you can do in, for storytelling, in terms of coloring, in terms of what, what color brings to the story, which is something that they were very much the forefront of more when American comics were still doing, you know, 64 colors a page or whatever, flat colors. Um, the, that to me is, is what sets it apart. Fabrice, what do you think is different about what we do, our characters at Humanoids, compared to DC and Marvel? You know, I have, a, I have an anecdote. Um, Ridley Scott told me that he decided to do Blade Runner after having read a short story in Metal Law, which was The Long Tomorrow by Mobius and Dan O'Bannon. And that tells a lot. I think when we're developing a story, we actually take way more time than what uh, the big two do. I mean, uh, the latest installment of the Mid Barons, we developed the script over three years. <laughs> so it's like developing a movie. And I think that tells a lot because it's not that we are more, it's not that we are clever or more skilled. It's, it's we are spending more time. We're investing more money uh, and energy uh, giving the space to the to the creators to to take this time in order to really deliver what they can do deliver the best i think that makes the difference it's a different for us it's a different industry it's a different approach of the old industry what's the art back there what do you got back there uh here you have john cassaday i am legend which is interesting because it was the first time we would kind of mixed a great american artist with a great uh, european writer so how do you tell a story? It's not bond in it, it's not American comic books. You have to invent something. So that's, that's, uh, 
John Cassaday, I am legend, that's something that doesn't exist in, uh, in English. It's uh, so Varenne, it. yeah. it's, it's, Varen. it's uh, called Harder. And this guy revolutionized the comic book industry in Europe in, I would say, in the 90s, in approaching the storytelling. There were brothers, two brothers. Uh, and the, the way drawn was on, 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 on plastic, with using, you know, this band uh, thing, letra set, doing the, doing the, 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 the gray tone. Uh, fantastic. Mark and I are, are, are of that age. We know what yeah, that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fantastic. And here you have Guy Davis uh, and Jerry Friesen in okay. the Zombies at the World, the Z Ward, which is fantastic. It's, it's, uh, it's something that everyone should read uh, nowadays and with the election uh, looming. Uh, it's a it's a real uh, interesting satire on the on the society we live in. Oh, great. Yeah, uh, actually, that's a perfect read for the pandemic slash the election. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want. Um, I don't want to derail the panel, but I do. Uh, but uh, if, if it was a different you, kind of panel, I would, we would do two of us in office too. I want to see. That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we can do a tour after. It'll be like a bonus section of the panel okay. that you never get before because usually panels are in person. That's right. I like it. I'm going to copyright that idea. Um, okay, so second to last question. Um, how do you think humanoids has impacted not only your work, but just your view on the comic book world as a whole? And with this, we're going to start with Mark Russell. Well, I think as Fabrice said, is like the, the time is really the key ingredient. And I think that's that's one thing I've, I've tried to do when possible with my work. And I think largely it's because I see these, these com what can be done with the medium with things like Inkle, I try to take time and not just like consider something good enough to ask myself how I can take it to that next level, how I can, you know, I try to like detonate as much of my soul as possible on the page because I, 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 I know other people have gotten away with it. Love that. Tula. Um, yeah, it's kind of, um, just massively influenced my art style. Um, you know, even when I was teen, I was like copying stuff from some of my favorite humanoids comics. It's, it's how I learned to draw. Um, and, you know, kind of my drawings are, are, are not really like, I, I work for DC and Marvel a lot, but they don't really fit fit in with that house style. I'm a lot, lot more painterly. Um, and I think those sensibilities have definitely come from humanoids and a lot of the European comic side look at growing up where you just have these spectacular um, pieces of art that, you know, are, are colored with watercolor and um, just just as standing art. And um, I still think I'm, I'm trying to kind of reach that level, humanoids level. I'm not not quite there yet, but I, I will get there one day. <laughs> I think you are. I love your art, so. You. Um, Brian. Well, you know, the one part we haven't talked about uh, is um, the packaging of this material um, in so many, uh, may I say, inspiring uh, formats is uh, for uh, nerds like, specific nerds like us, a, <laughs> a delightful beyond, beyond measure. I, I really, appreciate how much effort has gone into these monster books and, and also most of us on this panel have published our own material ourselves by hand you know the kid you know that extra little care that goes into uh every choice and you can tell with humanoids a lot of decision making was made like they didn't just throw this together and put it out like what what best services the story what best services the spotlight of the artist and to have all this material and some of it i've triple dipped because uh, they've earned my triple dip, right? I, I, you know, we've all triple dipped and, oh, they got me again. But when, when Humanoids comes along with a different format, you never feel like you're being taken. You feel like, oh, thank you. If, I, if there's any, uh, anything else I ever wanted from the Incal or from uh, the other material, it's this different format that allows me to like really uh, admire it. Uh, so that, that, that's something I just wanted to... Uh, also, the other part is, this is the kind of story, and I talked about when people bring the in-call to me at, at a, and when we used to have what we call conventions, 
Yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, it, 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 you can see that it's a gateway story. It, it's a story. It's a story that takes you to another world. Yes, the possibilities of comics, but also an understanding of how people think in another part of the world, how people aspire towards a higher evolution or a higher technology in another part of the world. And that, of course, we know as storytellers is what really brings people together, what really brings understanding and compassion and empathy. So it's nice to have a publisher who literally is a gateway to another part of the world um, and, and brings it all. And like we live in Portland, Oregon, and there's a couple of stores here in Portland, like Cosmic Monkey, let's give them a plug, that has almost a shrine to humanoids and Mobius, uh, both in American editions and, and otherwise. Like you could, you could literally buy the whole Mobius um, library in French in, in Portland. And that's amazing. That's because humanoids opened a door for an audience for that. Yeah, I actually went there in February when we were there for Comics Pro and they were phenomenal. And they also had Mobius trading cards from the 90s that I bought multiple packs of to bring back to work. They do. Um, right. they, they were they were amazing talking to them. There was one of my favorite things that happened during Comics Re Pro for sure. Regarding yeah. the format and the size of the books, you should have seen the face of the bookstores owners and comic bookstores owners when in 1998 we came with the first oversized not even the size of what you you shown us before brian but oversized they thought we were crazy they said it doesn't fit in the shelf no yeah we've all had that conversation yeah. so we had to fight and slowly i mean uh, and now if we don't really sum of our titles in that uh, format we get angry emails <laughs> I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm deeply happy that that part of publishing was past us. Yeah. That was that was a mindset for many, many years, particularly when I broke in. And I'm, thanks to you and others, it is over. So right. If it can't fit on a shelf, if it can't fit in a bag, mm -hmm. then then why do I have it? I know that. So glad we've managed to peel away from that. Yeah. From a sales perspective, though, if a book is that large, you have to put it face out. So we just have made it so we have more face out time for ourselves at comic stores. Yeah, it demands attention. It does. Yeah. Mark, now you get to answer the question as well. So yeah, how has humanoids impacted it, how you write and what you do? Again, this is, I'm following everybody else's much better <laughs> answers, but I, for me, again, I, I tap into the fact that I can see things there that I can't see in American comics, just in terms of storytelling technique, in terms of color work, in terms of, of visuals. And it's always a constant reminder to me that I feel as a writer, like I have failed with a script unless I have one moment in there or one visual that you've never seen before. Something that even the smallest thing, but just something. Otherwise, if that it doesn't feel like a complete script to me. And again, that all comes from Watch, looking at what the humanoid stuff has, has accomplished over the years and watching, again, from a very American, very American perspective, what that work looks like. Yeah, and actually my last question is also for you, Mark, because you are newly minted as a publisher for humanoids. Mm -hmm. This has been really exciting. Um, so as the new publisher at Humanoids, what do you hope to bring to the legacy that Humanoids has created in the last few decades? Well, I, it's building on the legacy is really all it is. There's no, there's no grand, you know, left turn here. It's, it's, you, you know, you play the cards you're dealt and these are amazing hands we've been dealt, but it is continuing to push forward the sort of the transgressive nature of what humanoids does, the, the non-traditional formats, the non-traditional stories, the trying to show, and, and again, push boundaries I and mean, push boundaries of, of what is acceptable in today's society. And I would much rather err on the side of going too far than on the side of being timid and tame. So that's, I mean, that really is the philosophy going forward. And we're going to have some exciting stuff going forward. Oh my God. We really, I mean, we really do. We've got, <laughs> we really you know, do. Lot, we really do. I mean, we got, we've got a lot of stuff lined up. We can't announce yet, but we've been talking very close. I mean, I, this is, you know, it's part of the reason you pull somebody like me in is because I've got a big Rolodex, right? So I just, you know, we calling in my friends and calling in favors and calling in people that I've worked with over the years and people who I've not worked with, but can't wait to work with. And we have a real murderer's row of projects that we're going to start pulling out, you know, announcing and, and, and putting forth real soon. It's exciting. 
Yeah. Well, that's all the questions that I have for all of you. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Humanoids Legacy panel and giving us your thoughts and opinions as creators. It really has been truly insightful and really fun. So thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.